Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're stopping by the Virginia Gun Collectors Association at the 2023 NRA show to check out their historic display about a prototype mule ear muzzleloader. Hi, I'm Mark Arellick. I'm with the Virginia Gun Collectors Association. We meet once a month in Virgin Northern Virginia. We have over 500 members and we collect all sorts of guns from, you know, muzzle loaders from match locks up to the latest black cutting edge black rifles okay. uh, the display here is about the u.s navy jenks muleer uh, carbines and rifles they were made in 1841 they were a number of firsts and onlys okay. in u.s uh, gun making history in u.s military history they were the first uh, u.s navy breech loader first U.S. Navy uh, percussion gun, the uh, first U.S. military gun to use the Maynard Tape Primer, the, U, the first U.S. military gun to use the Remington cast steel barrel, and they were the only U.S. military gun to use a side hammer with the nipple going through the lock plate. They also introduced uh, mechanically some really innovative ideas. This over here is a prototype uh, side hammer made by Ames Company. N.P. Ames, the sword maker, actually made most of the Jenks Muleers. And uh, it's a prototype side hammer. Only three are known to still exist. They don't know how many were actually made. And this is the only one with brass hardware furniture on it, and that uh, doesn't have any Ames markings on it. But they know it's made by Ames because it's exactly like the other two that they know. Wow. So were the other two prototypes marked? They were marked on the lock plate NP Ames. The Jenks Mule was also only one of two firearms that Ames made. In uh, 1840, uh, Ames had a bunch of investors. They said, hey, percussion's coming along. We can make a lot of money if we make firearms, percussion firearms, as well as swords. Ames was primarily a sword maker. Uh, so they looked, and this is one of them. The other firearm that Ames made was uh, down below the uh, model 1842 box lock pistol that the U.S. Navy adopted. Now, the way these worked, which is interesting, is it was a side hammer breech loader. So what they do is they'd bring it to half cock, open the action, keep the muzzle down. It was 52 caliber. They drop in a ball. They took balls, not many. Not many. Ball would roll forward up against the rifling or, or up against the bore. Pour in the powder, they took about 70 grains of powder, close that, it would compress the powder, put the cap on the nipple, and what's interesting is it was extremely safe. One, it was side hammer, uh, so the wooden gas wasn't coming up. Also, the nipple is surrounded by two rings of steel. The inside ring is on the hammer, and then there's an outside ring that goes around there. So there's no little pieces, copper pieces of, you know, cap flying up into your eyes. Put the cap on, bring it to full cock. That's the hammer? That's the hammer, side hammer. And shoot. Uh, the way they were made was because the ball is a little bit bigger than the bore. If you look here, compresses that. The breech bolt goes past the loading port, compresses the powder. That keeps it down. Uh, there's a little triangular cutout over here in the face which is right where the nipple is. So, it ex so when the fire goes through, it, it's right there. It's right there. Uh, direct ignition. Direct ignition. Plus, the, the secret is the compression rod, which kept it closed. 
It couldn't it, come back. It couldn't come back, and this could not open. But as an added safety feature was the mule air, which kept that from opening. Later they found they didn't really need that because the compression rod would keep it closed anyway. It had a higher muzzle velocity than most other guns then. Uh, it had uh, more penetrating power than a lot of guns. Basically, there was little to no windage, and all the, almost all the powder would burn. Because it didn't have anywhere else to go. It right? didn't have anywhere else to go. Uh, and like I said, it had greater penetrating power. It was also, despite the short barrel, more accurate than a lot of the longer barrel guns. Later on, uh, the Navy liked them. They made, uh, altogether, uh, Navy took about 6,500 of them. Army didn't like them. Army, you know, they were conservative. Uh, but Navy liked them. They went back uh, for another contract. There were a number of contracts. And they said, well, we want to try it with the Maynard Tate primer. So Jenks, the inventor, went to, back to Ames. Back then, a guy would design and invent it, the gun, and then go to a manufacturer to make. Uh, but Ames was getting out of the gun-making business. He said, you know, I'm getting old, I'm getting sick. I just want to concentrate on swords, I'm getting out. Jenks and Ames went up the street in Connecticut to Remington. Remington said, yeah, I'll make it, I'll take on the contract. Ames sold all his manufacturing equipment to Remington, and Remington made them with the Maynard Tate primer. One of the things that they found was with the Maynard Tate primer, it was difficult to have the mule air going across. So they got rid of the mule air and found that they really didn't need it as a safety feature. Uh, as you know, the Maynard Tate primer was a good idea, but in practice, when it's wet out, it didn't really work. Uh, but the Navy still you know, like them. They were very robust during the testing in 1841. Uh, Navy fired one over 14,000 times uh, without any mishaps. Uh, and it finally, the only breakage was uh, cracked nipple, which is easily oh, yeah. fixed. Easily replaced. Yeah, they were very robust, only eight parts which is something. Uh, by the time, right before the Civil War, that, but they were wearing out. You know, sailors never clean their guns. And, you know, they're in a salt water environment. Yeah. So, you know, there were corrosion, fouling, etc. Navy was looking, well, you know, can we sell them off and can we also extend the life of those that are in the best shape? Merrill came out. William Merrill of, uh, James Merrill, James Merrill of Baltimore said, hey, let me try and use my uh, breech loading system. So he did a conversion. He took off the side hammer, put on a conventional hammer, put on a bolster, uh, took out Close the loading port, plug the loading port, and you can still see the Jenks Navy markings on there, and put in his own action. Uh, sent 288 to 290 to the Navy. Navy tested them, and oh, we fired them, and these, we ain't gonna take them. <laughs> they, Merrill said, well, it's the, it's the latch, let me fix the latch. He fixed the latch, sent them 240 back to the Navy. Navy put them on ships for trials. Uh, reports came back. We're not even going to shoot them. We're doing the manual of arms, and the latch pops open. Navy put them in storage. You know, and they were hurting during the Civil This is 1860, so on. 
hurting during the Civil War, but they weren't going to... Still weren't taking those out. Yeah, I mean, they, they were hurting for small arms. Right. And they were still flogging these along, but weren't going to take these out. Or if they did, it was like last-ditch emergency. Uh, I mean, Merrill later fixed it, right. the problem, and, you know, made a lot of them rifles and carbines and did a lot of conversions, but then no. And uh, that's basically the jank story. I'd like to thank Mark for giving me some time here at the show. I w I'll admit I was caught by the muzzleloader in the front case, but it was super interesting to go through the history of the Jinx side lock muzzleloader or the mule ear muzzleloader here to see how many times he tried to standardize this and make it popular among the military contracts and common use at the time. Super interesting and definitely a name that I wasn't super familiar with when it came to muzzleloader and, and then just firearms technology advancement anyway. Um, so it was really interesting. I can't thank Mark enough. I'll have some links in the description of this video as well as at ilovemuzzleloading.com for you to check out more from Mark and the Virginia Gun Collectors Association. If you're in Virginia and you're interested in old firearms and firearms technology, be sure to give them a, a, a look. They do an annual show each year there in Virginia that I think will give you uh, some access and some interest uh, and some interesting pieces to oogle at with the Virginia Gun Collectors Association. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.